faith and being able to hold our faith as an integral part of the life of the mind and to put those together, it remains to be seen how we each do that, but it is a goal of this college to help all of us, young people, faculty, staff, the larger community, to wrestle with the questions of the day and to bring the fullest of our heart and our head together. So I'm so thankful that you have taken time out of your busy schedule, braved sitting on the floor with me and helping think together with an amazing bishop of the Episcopal Church of this country. This college, as most of you know, is a proud institution of the United Church of Christ in that it holds a place of faith and mind and heart together and it understands that there will be conflict and division and we learn to talk and reason together as a civil campus and a civil society. So it's one of the reasons why we're inviting the student body to come together next Tuesday at 1 o'clock to talk with Mark and Ron Bochamp and others, Michelle if she can be here, and myself at 1 o'clock downstairs in the CAF after the Illuminae service to talk about what happens tonight and how to help integrate that. But apart from that, we also know that tonight's lecture allows for you all to hear from a gentleman who is a saint of the church and has given his life to the faith and to the church, not just the Episcopal Church, but the Church Universal. I am thankful that there are organizations here on campus like Safe and Sage, Crew, Spiritual Life Council, our Muslim Student Association, the Catholic Campus Ministry, our UCC Fellowship, a long list of growing groups that talk about how to integrate faith, life, and meaning. Next week we will have Pride Week on this campus as we also talk about the Holocaust. And I invite you to come back Sunday night as we bring James Carroll here to reflect on and start the questions of the Holocaust in the 21st annual guestship of this college. This night, for me, is about talking about health and hope, both in sexuality questions and spirituality questions. It is the season of Lent for those of us within the Christian tradition. It is a time when we talk about reflection, redemption, and the place of where we are in that journey towards Jerusalem with our Lord and Savior. For many, however, it's beyond that a question of the moral compass. And what is our moral compass individually and as a college? And to help with that moral compass, I've asked our own dean of our faculty, Dr. Alzada Tipton, to come this evening and to reflect briefly on why this evening and this lecture is important. For the students, your faculty are here, your president is here, other staff and administration have come to help you and all of us wrestle with great questions and to think about where we are individually as a college and where you shall go. Each of you will walk across the stage and shake the hand of a class of 50 years from now. 1961 for those of you who walk. One of you will come back in 2061 to shake that hand. The world that you inherit and work with is the world that we bring people like Bishop Spong and others to help you reflect on that and to be together as a college family. Will you join me in bringing our wonderful Dean, Dr. Alzada Tipton, if Alzada Tipton to bring us into this night, please. tonight, I would like to do something that might seem a little unexpected and begin with a concept from literary theory. It will seem less unexpected to you when you learn that I'm a professor of English, but more important, it is quite appropriate to talk about literary criticism before the talk of a distinguished biblical scholar, because the origins of literary criticism and literary analysis are easily located in biblical exegesis the practice of creating interpretations of biblical stories and passages that are meant to more fully, more amply, and in more multiple ways express the meaning of those biblical stories and passages. 
The practice of biblical exegesis, as old as the Bible itself, shows that this is a book which has never been interpreted only literally. Indeed, there is no better example of the allegorical and symbolic nature of the Bible than the example of Jesus and his use of parables, metaphors, and similes. I think it's pretty clear to everybody that Jesus didn't mean grain when he was talking about wheat and chaff. What I would like to think about for a minute or two tonight is the type of literary theory called reader response theory. This was a theory that came forward in the late 1960s and 70s. In thinking about the meaning of a literary text, one can draw a triangle that has as its points author, text, and reader. Literary criticism in the 19th century had largely been about the author, the author's life, the author's intentions for the text. Literary criticism in the early and mid 20th century, new criticism, focused on the text only, with the explicit intent to exclude considerations of the author or the time period. Reader response theory brought in that last point of the triangle, brought the reader into this consideration, acknowledging that the reader is a crucial factor in the creation of a text's meaning. This is pretty obvious when you think about it. If a book sits on a shelf unread, it doesn't mean much of anything because it doesn't mean to anybody. It would be the literary equivalent of that tree we all know that falls in the forest with nobody to hear it. There were many well, very well-known critics who created, expanded, or embraced reader response theory, including Stanley Fish, Wolfgang Eiser, and Roland Barthes. One of my favorite pieces of reader response theory is Stanley Fish's book on Paradise Lost called Surprised by Sin. This probably seems less unexpected when you learn that I am a professor of British Renaissance literature. <laughs> Fish's extremely interesting argument is that if you as a reader are lured into the experience of finding Satan a more appealing figure than God in Paradise Lost, which is quite a common opinion, Samuel Taylor Coleridge is a famous example of somebody who holds that opinion, then you are initially being steered into the poem by having by the poem into having the same intellectually fallacious thought process that caused Lucifer in the poem to fall and become Satan with the hope that the poem will cause further reading engagement which will allow you to understand this and correct it with the result that your process of reading the poem becomes itself a theological experience. So maybe that's kind of an esoteric example for you. So let me give you another one that I've often given to my students in my Shakespeare class about the Shakespeare play, The Merchant of Venice. One of the most famous moments in this play, as you know, is Shylock the Jew's plea for recognition of the humanity of Jewish people. His question, if you prick us, do we not bleed? The meaning of that moment for modern readers is inextricably and unavoidably tied up with the Holocaust. Its full meaning must encompass for us, for now and forevermore, our thoughts and emotions about that Holocaust. So as you've no doubt concluded, this type of literary theory is very relevant to the work of Bishop Spong, and I hope a useful way to begin thinking about some of the issues he will be talking about tonight. However, the issues he will be talking about tonight have, a very, have very different consequences and a very different impact than the usual consequences of interpreting literature like Shakespeare or Milton. People live and die only by their critical reputation in discussing different interpretations of works of literature. And the consequences for anything other than English professors' professional egos are rather minimal. <laughs> so I would like us to think about the situation we find ourselves in when an interpretation of a book can literally mean life and death. We have only to think about Matthew Shepard or Tyler Clementi to realize that homophobia can be lethal. And so, we need to consider the role that all societal institutions, including religion, play in encouraging or combating homophobia. And we need to think about how we, as readers of the Bible, are always active agents in the shaping of the meaning of that pivotal text, and what our responsibilities to our fellow human beings are as we shape that meaning. This is truly a monumental responsibility for us all. I am so grateful, as are all of you, I have no doubt, that we have Bishop John Spong here to help us to figure this out tonight. And now I would like to call upon student Ray Nelson to introduce the bishop. Thank you. Hello. Welcome. 
It is my distinct pleasure this evening to welcome Bishop John Spong and introduce him to you all. Bishop Spong was the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Newark for 24 years before his retirement in 2001. As Bishop and in retirement, he is admired as a teacher who makes the contemporary theology access accessible to the ordinary layperson. He's considered a champion for an inclusive faith by many, both inside and outside the Christian church. During his tenure as bishop, he was a fearless advocate for church reform, a hero to some, a heretic to others, as he was the first to ordain an openly gay priest and has been on the forefront of building a biblical base for, for an inclusive church that welcomes people regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity. He has called for Christians worldwide to leave behind pre-modern religion in favor of liberal faith. Bishop Spong is a visiting lecturer at Harvard and speaks regularly at colleges and churches worldwide. His best-selling books include Rescuing the Bible from Fundamentalism, A New Christianity for a New World, Why Christianity Must Change or Die, The Sins of Scripture, Exposing the Bible's Texts of Hate to Discover the God of Love, and Here I Stand. This evening, Bishop Spong is joined by his spouse, Christine, whom we also welcome. And now, please join me warmly in welcoming just Bishop Spong to Elmhurst College for a conversation on faith. that audio-visual equipment is demon-possessed. <laughs> I just had one more illustration of that. <laughs> I've had a wonderful day today going around this campus, meeting students, meeting faculty, meeting some of the local clergy. And now I have the privilege of addressing you this evening. I'd like to address you on the subject of prejudice. More specifically, on the role of religion in creating prejudice. Something that probably someone who is within the religious fold ought to be the one to address. And I'd like to do it, if I might, autobiographically. Because my sense is that I can show you my pattern of growth through my prejudices. Perhaps you can find a way to grow through your prejudices. So let me begin. I was raised in an evangelical Episcopal church in the Bible Belt of the South in Charlotte, North Carolina. I lived one block from Billy Graham. He was the last paper on my Charlotte Observer paper route. <laughs> The church that I attended taught me that segregation was the will of God, and they quoted the Bible to prove it. People of color were not welcomed in that church. Indeed, if a person of color had come to that church to join in the Sunday morning worship service, the police would have been called, the person would have been arrested for trespassing. My church also taught me that women were by nature, by creation, inferior to men. And that's why no woman could take a position of responsibility in the church. And that's why no woman could even think about the possibility of being ordained. Women, we were told, were not created in the image of God. There must be something about the male body that's more godlike than the female body. <laughs> Otherwise, this would not make sense. The man had to represent God before the altar. And a woman somehow couldn't do that. It was a rather strange argument. <laughs> the only way I know to test it is to place a man and a woman side by side 
and remove from the man everything he has in common with the woman. About 99.9% .9 of his body. <laughs> Until you have the single distinguishing male <laughs> Then you say, that's obviously where the image of God is. <laughs> It's a rational argument <laughs> But of course, we quoted the Bible to prove this truth. <laughs> Women were defined as property. That's why you could have polygamy. Because a man could have as many wives as he could afford, just like as many cattle as he could afford, or as many sheep as he could afford. And that's why women had to take marriage vows to obey <coughs> their husbands until relatively in recent history. What changed me on my racism was the Civil Rights Movement. What changed me on my attitude toward women was the fact that I became the father of daughters. <laughs> we had four daughters. It was a very feminine household. We had a male cat, but they operated on him. <laughs> It wasn't safe to be a male in that house. <laughs> and my daughters weren't just ordinary women. They were boundary-pushing feminists. <laughs> and I saw things through the eyes of my daughters that I'd never been able to see through the eyes of my wife or through the eyes of my mother. One of my daughters is today the managing director of a major southern bank. My second daughter is an attorney and serves as the staff attorney to the Supreme Court of the state of Virginia. My third daughter has a PhD in physics from Stanford and is in the high tech industry in Santa Barbara. And our fourth daughter is a nine year veteran of the United States Marine Corps, a helicopter pilot with three tours of duty in the Iraq war. She is today living in Burundi in Africa, working in a medical, medical clinic as part of her preparation now to be a physician. It's very hard to believe in the second class status of women and have people like this for your daughters. <laughs> I remember when I was the Bishop of Newark speaking to the Archbishop, my counterpart, my Roman Catholic counterpart, his name was Theodore McCarrick. And I said to him, Ted, the Roman Catholic Church will never get its head straight about women until your priests have daughters. <laughs> I never will forget the quizzical look on his face because it just didn't compute. <laughs> Put that together. My church taught me some other things. My church taught me that it was okay to hate other religions. And most especially, it was okay to hate the Jews. And of course, they quoted the Bible to prove it. I absorbed all of my anti-Semitism in Sunday school. That's where I learned it. It was like osmosis. In all of my Sunday school career, I never encountered a good Jew. They were always evil, dark, and sinister. They had names like Pharisees and Sadducees and Judas Iscariot and Annas and Caiaphas. When you'd read the fourth gospel, the phrase, the Jews, would sort of fall from your lips with a slur. Do you know, in all my Sunday school career, nobody ever told me that Jesus was a Jew? <laughs> that sort of escaped their notice. <laughs> When I saw pictures of him, he didn't look like a Jew to me. He had blonde hair, blue eyes, and fair skin. I thought he was a Swede. It's amazing how religion demonizes anybody that's not part of its particular point of view. We act as if religion is something we are supposed to impose upon other people. The final thing that I learned in my church and what I'd like to spend most of my time addressing this evening is that my church taught me that homosexual people were evil. 
Actually, they didn't teach me much about that because, you see, we didn't have any homosexuals in the South. <laughs> <laughs> they were certainly not visible. I don't think I heard the word homosexual until I was at least 16. And I had no earth earthly idea what it meant. If I'd been a young kid awakening to my sexual identity at age 12 or 13 and it turned out to be a homosexual, I would not have even had a word in my vocabulary to be able to describe what I was feeling. It helps me to understand why the suicide rate is so high among gay young people. When I did hear the word homosexual, I accepted my region's interpretation of it. There was a liberal position. Homosexual people were sick, mentally sick. And so the only proper stance was to try to cure them. We have lots of religious organizations that think they can cure homosexual people. They ought to be arrested for practicing medicine without a license, and they do irreparable harm. But at least if it's a sickness, it meant maybe they couldn't help it, and if you couldn't feel anything else, maybe pity was the most positive response that would be available. And the other alternative, sort of the conservative approach, was that homosexuals were morally depraved people. And that's why they chose this morally depraved lifestyle. So they ought to be converted. <coughs> so you either tried to cure them or you tried to convert them, and if you couldn't convert them, it was okay to bash them. And if your name was Matthew Shepard, it was okay to kill them. And when Matthew Shepard was buried, he was a young Episcopalian from Wyoming. When he was buried, the Reverend Fred Phelps from Kansas picketed the funeral and he carried a sign that said, the Bible says fags should die. See Leviticus 20. <coughs> yes, my church taught me my homophobia. And he quoted the Bible to prove it. You see, I had a lot to overcome. And every one of these prejudices, before I could overcome it, I also had to overcome a particular way that Holy Scripture was being used. I need to say to you that change is possible. And it can even happen late in your life. I was elected bishop in northern New Jersey when I was 44 years old, and I was still deeply homophobic. He wasn't conscious. I didn't actively hate homosexual people. I just simply didn't engage the issue. It wasn't on my radar screen. I'd never lived in a community where people were open about their sexual identity. To my knowledge, I did not know a homosexual person. And I certainly didn't know one who was comfortable being homosexual and not ashamed of being homosexual. But I had a lot of learning to do when I moved to northern New Jersey. We had some towns in northern New Jersey like Hoboken that are famous for more than just being Frank Sinatra's hometown. Hoboken's population was about 40% homosexual. It was called Greenwich Village West. The mayor of Hoboken would always march in the gay pride parade. No politician's going to give up 40% of the vote before he starts. <laughs> This is a different experience. And I began to absorb the fact that I was living in a very different world. And I was also a new bishop. I've never been smarter than I was as a new bishop. <laughs> you know, we say a bishop, they either grow or swell, and I was doing both. <laughs> so I took my position. Within a very, I didn't know the people there. I was from the South. I'd never been in New Jersey except to land at the Newark airport and catch the train into New York. I didn't know people really stayed in New Jersey. <laughs> I'd been in my office for a very short period of time. We had about 280 clergy. I didn't know them. And so periodically they would make appointments to come meet their new bishop. 
So I had an apartment. I didn't know the man was, didn't know him except by reputation. I knew he was well thought of, well loved, well appreciated by his congregation. I was told that he was not married. That didn't raise any issues with me. And so I went in to meet him, a regular appointment, and we did what you usually do. We chit-chatted about the weather and whether the Yankees defeated the Red Sox the night before. Until finally I said, well, you know, what's on your mind? And I wasn't prepared for his response. He said, Bishop, he learned to call me Jack later, he said, Bishop, I want you to know I didn't vote for you to be the Bishop of Newark, but you got elected, so I've got to live with that. And I've never been dishonest with my Bishop in my life, and I'm not going to start with you. So let me tell you out front that I'm a gay man. To my knowledge, I've always been a gay man. And I perceive that you have some difficulty with that. So I'd like to offer you my services in whatever way I can be to help you understand homosexuality. Well, new bishops don't have a sense that they have any great need. <laughs> and I certainly wasn't prepared to talk about that, and I don't remember exactly how I responded. But I suspect it was that I would operate under some version of don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> I certainly wasn't going to lead a crusade or a witch hunt against gay people, but I also wanted it so quiet that I never had to deal with it publicly. But what bothered me about this man is that he was clearly not mentally ill. <laughs> he was clearly not morally depraved. He was a very honorable, outstanding leadership person, much beloved, highly respected. And so it didn't compute for me. A stereotype didn't fit this experience, and that was just the beginning. A couple of weeks later, it fell to me as the new bishop to go out and form a priest in one of our suburban communities in northern New Jersey that we were going to close his church. That's a pretty disruptive sort of message. This is a church that we had been trying to, to get functioning for about 10 years. We'd poured an enormous amount of money into it. They'd finally made a decision that they were going to fully fund that church for three years, and if it hadn't made any progress, we were going to withdraw all funding and just close the enterprise. And I got elected bishop just about the time the three years was over. <laughs> and the church has actually done worse with full funding than it did with partial funding. So it was a story that we could no longer perpetuate. So I thought it would at least be the proper thing for me not to call this priest to my office and sit across the table in a power relationship and inform him that we were closing his church. So I called him up and told him I had some things that I needed to talk with him about. And I'd like to drop by his house on Wednesday afternoon at 3 o'clock. And I'm sure that was enough. I mean, when the bishop says, I'm going to come by to see you, that's pretty bad news, generally. <laughs> so I suspect that was enough to create the anxiety, but I found him. He was serving in a sort of working class community, a kind of Archie Bunker kind of town. And I found his house, went in, I'd never met him before that I was aware of, introduced myself, and we sat down and began to uh, chat. The only thing I knew about him was that he was a single man. When I got into his house, it was obvious he didn't live alone. There were all sorts of signs that the house was occupied by more than one. That was no problem. In urban America, it's not safe to live alone. And a lot of people share housing. That didn't raise any issues with me. So I told him that we were going to have to close this church. We were going to give him about six months. I told him that I would help get him another assignment. I actually told him it was pretty convenient that he was not married because it wouldn't disrupt his wife and his children in school, and I was sure that I could find another place in the diocese for him. And we chatted, and I stayed there a right long time. And so I needed to use the restroom. So I said, Paul, where is your bathroom? And he pointed me down the hall. And I went down the hall, and I closed the door, and I looked around the bathroom, and the towel said, his and his. <laughs> and I looked above the towel rack, and there were portraits of gay 
nudes, uh, not male nudes, not, I didn't know they were gay or not, they were male nudes. <laughs> That's when it finally dawned on my southern heart <laughs> and I was dealing with a gay couple. And so I came out of the bathroom and went back in and said, Paul, you have a very interesting bathroom. <laughs> He said, I thought you might notice. <laughs> I said, would you tell me about it? He said, yes. The man I live with is my life partner. I love him as much as you love your wife. And if I ever have to choose between my vocation as a priest and my partner, I want you to know right now, I choose my partner. I swallowed hard, and I said, Paul, if this ever becomes public, I don't have the power to protect you. And he said, you don't, or you won't. Rather perceptive. <laughs> and then I tried another tact. I said, Paul, I could not allow an unmarried heterosexual couple to live in the church's rectory. And he said, but they have a choice. They can get married anytime they want to. Neither my church nor my society, my nation has given me the right to marry my partner. <coughs> that seems so logical, but I never thought that. <laughs> well, I again gave out some version of don't ask, don't tell, and went out and got into my car and drove away. But that conversation was like a pebble in my shoe. It didn't hurt enough to have to remove it, but it was always there. And so I wrestled with it. And after a couple of more experiences like this, I became very aware that I would never be an effective bishop in this part of my country unless I knew something more about sexual orientation. So I called up a friend of mine who was on the faculty of the Cornell School of Medicine. His name was Robert Lahita. I said, Bob, I'm aware of the fact that I don't know enough about sexual orientation to be effective in this position. I wonder if the doctors at Cornell would be willing to educate a bishop. They'd never had an opportunity to educate a bishop before. <laughs> They'd never known a bishop that either wanted or needed to be educated. <laughs> and so they, that was sort of a challenge to them. So I started going over to the Cornell Medical Center and reading all of their papers and seeing the stuff they were doing in their laboratories and talking with the doctors. And after about six months, my mind was in a very different place. I came to these conclusions. No one chooses his or her sexual orientation. I don't know why that was such a surprise. I certainly hadn't chosen mine. I didn't wake up when I was 12 or 13 and say, ah, I'll decide to be heterosexual. Indeed, I didn't even know what that word was. I just woke up somewhere between my 12th and 13th birthday, and suddenly girls did not seem obnoxious to me any longer. <laughs> I not make a decision about that. And I started doing weird things, like take a bath more frequently, <laughs> like comb my hair, like use deodorant. My mother saw this strange behavior in her adolescent son, and she said, the sap has risen, and I didn't know what that meant either. <laughs> choose. And it suddenly dawned on me that if I didn't choose my sexual orientation, why do I think somebody else chose theirs? Can you imagine a young 12, 13 year old gay kid waking up and saying, aha, I'll decide to be homosexual. I love being banished from my family and, and beat up by my friends and condemned by my church and run out of town and fired from my job, and sometimes even killed. I just love that. So I'll be a homosexual. Now, people don't choose. Sexual orientation is a given. We don't choose it, we awaken to our identity. Another thing I learned with Dr. Lahir and those other doctors are that homosexuality is present in the animal kingdom. 
particularly among the mammals. It's very hard to demonstrate that something is, quote, unnatural if it appears in nature. <laughs> you can document that. That's not a secret. That's easy to understand. <clears throat> Another thing I learned is that the number of homosexual persons in the population appears to be generally fixed within a certain range. There's some debate about the range, but most people would say it's somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of the population. And that appears to be true in all cultures, in all time, in all history, in all nations. I had an African bishop tell me that there were no homosexuals in Africa. He said, that's an English disease. I thought that was an <laughs> But if you know you're going to be put to death if you come out of the closet, you become quite invisible. People think that when you have a gay-friendly culture, it creates more homosexuals. That's not true. It just allows more homosexual people the chance to be honest about who they are. But all the studies indicate that the number of people whose sexual orientation is toward their own gender is pretty well set in all populations, in all nations, in all cultures, for all time. Which, of course, means that those things we used to think of that caused it can't be accurate. You can't have that many weak fathers or dominating mothers so it comes out in the same percentage <laughs> over and over again. So I came to the conclusion that no one could cause another person to become homosexual. Please don't, un don't misunderstand. I think if anyone undergoes a sexually abusive experience, it's detrimental, sometimes terribly destructive. But it would never turn a person who's not gay into being gay. That's propaganda. That's ignorance. Now, nobody can change, can cause a person to become homosexual. And nobody can cure one because it's not a disease. There's no such thing as a cure. Oh, one of these organizations actually published a book, or at least tried to publish a book, about how homosexuals had been cured by prayer therapy. And they had all these ex-homosexuals write chapters about their experience. And between the time the chapters were written and the time the book was published, most of them had reverted to type. So the book had to be canceled. I'm amazed at how many people who are overtly hostile to homosexuals themselves turn out to be homosexuals. <laughs> It's part of the cover. The final thing I learned with Dr. Lahida and the, and the Cornell doctors is that homosexual people are not born on the planet Krypton. <laughs> they are your sons and your daughters. They are your brothers and your sisters. They are your cousins and your aunts and your uncles. They are your priests, your football players, and your policemen. They are in all levels of our society. And many of them live in secrecy and in fear. And they live in communities where even the people they love the most tell terrible stories about homosexual persons. Let me relate one of those stories. I had the privilege of meeting a young gay man in the Castro district in San Francisco. And I learned his story. Early in his life, he became aware that he was different. But his father, at regularly at dinner, would rant about queers. And so this young man never felt comfortable talking about the things he was experiencing with his father or with his mother. So he finished high school, and he lived on the East Coast. He decided to go to a California school. He wanted to get as far away from his family as possible. And he managed, while he was at that school, always to have something that kept him there during the summer. And they kept him there over most of the holidays. 
If he got home, it would be just for a day. And after a while, the relationship with his parents got to the place where they hardly ever wrote, and they hardly ever called. This young man finished college and got a job and went to work, living in San Francisco, and he became part of the gay culture. And he contracted the HIV virus. And that was in the period of time when HIV was a sentence of death. And the one thing he wanted to do before he died was to reconcile himself with his mother and father, but he didn't know how to do that. And so he went to talk to a Methodist chaplain. And they decided that the best way to do was for him to write them a letter and tell, him what, tell them what his situation was and tell them that his greatest desire was to find a reconciliation with mother and father before his inevitable death. They thought writing a letter would be easier for the parents than a telephone call or even than a personal visit so they could react privately before they had to react publicly. And so he and the chaplain framed this letter sensitively as they knew how. The parents are going to learn in this letter that their son was gay, that he was HIV positive, and that he was under a fatal diagnosis, all in one letter. And so the letter was mailed. And a week or so passed before they got a response. And when the response came, the young man did not want to open it alone. He was fearful. So he went back down with the letter to the chaplain, and they sat down and they opened the letter together. And when the envelope was opened, shreds of paper came out of the envelope. And it was this young man's birth certificate that had been torn to shreds and mailed to him by his mother and father. That kind of pain is incredible, particularly when you understand that homosexuality is not a choice it's simply a minority on the spectrum of human sexuality. As a part of the Christian church, it always bothered me that the Bible was thought to be the ultimate authority in the discussion of great issues like homosexuality. And I hear people today saying, there's one thing the Bible is quite sure about, and that is that homosexuality is a sin. May I tell you, that's absolute balderdash. <laughs> there are nine texts in the Bible that make any reference whatsoever to homosexuality. Two of them are simply a reference to the word Sodom that appear in two of the minor epistles in the New Testament. So if you take those two out, you're down to, not, to seven. Three more references that are interpreted to be condemnations of homosexuality are found in the corpus that we call the Pauline corpus, the Pauline epistles, sometimes pseudo-Pauline because Paul didn't write all that's attributed to him. And these are words, this is a word that the King James Bible defines and translates as sodomite or pervert. But the Greek word is arsenokoetis. And in the Greek language, it means literally a recessive male. And there is a high level of probability that it was a reference to the male temple prostitutes in the pagan world. But they've been translated to be homophobic. There's certainly a debate about that word in New Testament circles, but it's not a clear denunciation of homosexuals. That gets you down to four. Those four are first the Sodom and Gomorrah story, which is one weird story. <laughs> and it's a story in which Lot's wife looks backward and turns into a pillar of salt. I think that's literal. It's a story in which two angels, if you will, visit the town of Sodom and are given the protection of Lot's home before the mobs of the city wanted to do what they do to visitors who don't ever have a protection offered to them, they become game for gay sport. Not gay sport, they become game for sexual abuse. 
That was in the days before television had to have, have something to entertain the crowd periodically. So a stranger was at risk. There were no motels or hotels. You had to have the protection of a citizen's home where you were subject to sexual abuse. And so Lot gives these two angels the protection of his home right before the sun goes down. They'd already planned the evening's entertainment, and they were angry. And so they come beating on, on Lot's door. Let these men come out so that we might know them. It's an interesting word. And Adam knew Eve, and she conceived. It had a sexual connotation. You know what Lot says? He says, oh, you're being naughty. And I can't do that. I can't violate my word. But I'll tell you what I will do. I'll send my two virgin daughters out, and you can gang rape them. <laughs> That's what he says. I told they just women. Women didn't have much status. And at that point, the angels sort of remember that they're angels. <laughs> so they go zap, zap, and all the people outside go blind. And they're out there now feeling around, trying to figure out what's going on. And the angels say, Lot, it's time for you to get out of town. So Lot takes his two daughters and his wife, and they hit the highway. And the angels are with them. That's when they're warned not to look back, and Lot's wife looks back, and she turns into a pillar of salt. Then where do you go? This is the ancient world. You don't want to go to the next village and sit on the town square and wait for somebody to offer you the hospitality and protection of your home, lest you be gang raped. So they decide to go live in a cave. When they get into this cave, and now it's just Lot and his two daughters, they get in this cave, and these daughters begin to say, you know, we don't have a tribe anymore. We'll never be able to have husbands. We'll never be able to have children. And the implication in that story is that if you don't have a child, there's not much worth living if you're a woman. That's the whole purpose of being a woman. And this is the part of the story nobody ever reads. So they decide their only hope is to get pregnant by their father. You don't read that in church and then say, this is the word of the Lord. <laughs> have sex with him and both get pregnant and one produces a child named Ammon and one produces a child named Moab and the Bible says and they are the parents of the Amorites and the Moabites the Jews didn't think much of their neighbors now do you think that story can justify hostility to gay people <laughs> I mean that's a stretch <laughs> then they're two in Leviticus Leviticus 18 says that a man who lies with a man is an abomination. And Leviticus 20 says what the penalty shall be. They shall be put to death. Well, that's pretty severe. Even Jerry Falwell didn't want to go quite that far. But if you're going to be literal about the Bible, you can't pick and choose. <coughs> so the Bible calls for death for the crime of being homosexual. You don't treat that literally? Well, before you do, maybe I ought to take you into some other passages of the Bible that maybe you're not familiar with. See how many of you'd still be alive. <laughs> I could take you to the book of Deuteronomy, where it says, Any child that is willfully disobedient to his or her parents and talks back to his or her parents shall be delivered to the elders of the city and stoned until dead at the gates of the city. Raise your hands, those of you who'd still be alive. <laughs> The book of Leviticus says, if you have ever committed adultery, adultery, you shall be put to death. I shall not ask how many of you have committed adultery. <laughs> the Torah says that if you worship a false god, you shall be put to death. Well, who's going to define the true god? Is it going to be Pat Robertson? The Ayatollah Khomeini? Or Benedict XVI? Or Ian Paisley? Who's going to define the true God? No matter who defines it, an awful lot of people are at risk. And then there's one that I discovered only a couple of years ago. I've never heard it preached on, but it's in Leviticus 20, if you want to go look. It says, if you have sex with your mother-in-law, you are to be put to death. <laughs> I didn't mean, you knew that was in the Bible. 
How many of you ever heard that preached on? Why would somebody waste his breath preaching on something most people can't imagine doing? And when you laugh, it's because you just imagined it. to read the Bible, but literally is not one of them. <laughs> There's that wonderful story in the book of Numbers, where God speaks through Balaam's ass. <laughs> God speaks through the prophets. God speaks through Balaam's ass. Now, that's a donkey, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> but you've got to be careful. I'll never forget being in a conference when a young man was elected bishop and he was from another country and he was elected bishop in his country and he got the word of this conference and he didn't speak English very well. And so he stood up and said, oh, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and from my wife's bottom too. <laughs> there are lots of things about the Bible that if you read them literally, you are abysmally ignorant of what the, gospel, what the Bible writer is trying to say. If you look carefully at the Christian story, at the heart of that story is that no one is separated from the love of God. No one. The whole meaning of Jesus' life is that there is nothing any of us can ever do, nothing any of us can ever be that will separate us from the love of God. And that's what Jesus lives out. Betray him and he will love you. Deny him and he will love you. Abandon him and he will love you. Persecute him and he will love you. Kill him and he will love you. There's nothing you or I can ever do, nothing you or I can ever be that will separate us from the love of God. That's the essence of the Jesus message. How can you have that as the essence of the message? And discriminate against people of color or denigrate women because they're not men or insult and abuse homosexual people because they're not heterosexual. When you read the scriptures, you will find that Jesus is always on the side of the outcast. He embraces the leper. He challenges his religion every time it discriminates. He's portrayed as allowing the touch of the woman with the chronic menstrual discharge, even though the law said that menstruation meant you were unclean. The constant message of the Jesus figure is that God's love is not bounded by the limits of my ability to love or your love. Jesus thinks out about that for a minute and he says, no, no, that was not my purpose either. My experience with people that are very, very moral and very, very righteous is that they know a great deal about judgment, but they know almost nothing about loving. No, I didn't come to make you moral or righteous. Well, the disciples try again. Jesus, did you come so that we would have the true faith? We would be the orthodox believers. Jesus says, no. So my experience with people who think they have the true faith is they always put their wagons in a circle and start shooting at anybody who disagrees with them. <laughs> no, that wasn't my purpose. And then you have a sort of exasperation. Jesus, why did you come? John puts these words into Jesus' mouth. And I think they're the purpose, not just of Jesus, but of all religion. I have come, he said, that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. That's what we're in business for. You and I cannot be human while we denigrate the humanity of any other child of God. In the very act of denigrating another's humanity, we destroy our own humanity. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. Our call is to enhance the life of the people of the world. To call them into a fullness, a wholeness of their humanity. We do that in the Christian church, walking the Christ path. 
But surely in the other great religions of the world, there is a path to holiness and to wholeness that millions of people have walked, and they've walked with integrity. The time has come for us to stop out of our insecurity from spitting on the holy paths that have led to the fullness of another person's humanity. So when I look at my church, or the Christian church in general, or at all religious traditions, I want to call us into a unity based upon a common purpose. It is our purpose to help people become fully human, to give people life, and to give them that life abundantly. And there is no room for prejudice in that vocation. Thank you very much for your attention. Absolutely. I have a couple of rules for questions. Please. Every other question has to come from a woman. <laughs> and we also ask that each person introduce themselves, so. Well, wait a minute, I've got two more rules. <laughs> the second rule is try to make your questions questions, because we got a lot of people here and we don't have a lot of time. So try not to explain your question for 10 minutes before you ask it. And question and number three, I write a weekly column. Some of you may be anybody here to receive that column. It gets around. One feature of that column is a question and answer, and I got my questions from real audiences. And so if you'd be willing to write out your question, whether you ask it or not, and you need to give me your name and your hometown, because my publisher, a company in Seattle, won't publish it unless they have some authenticity, because they don't want me to sit up in my study and try to dream up questions that people <laughs> might have if they ever got a chance. And the way they want authenticity is they want your name. If you would be willing to make those questions available for me, I can't guarantee you that I'd use them, but I'd surely guarantee they would be considered. I only get to use one a week. But uh, if, if you'd like to do that, give them to me, give them to our chaplain, give them to my wife, it's easy to recognize she's the most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> and if you're interested in the column, there's a place somewhere, I don't know where, in the back there. You can sign up to receive it. In the back. Okay, with that, we'll recognize the first lady. Thank you. Thank you for tonight. Um, also, I want to thank you for not only speaking about this, but being a, a real advocate. I've watched the wonderful video that you did for Amy DeLong a United Methodist clergywoman who's being tried in Wisconsin for being gay and for having the audacity to serve all of God's people. I'm serving on her defense team, and I'm just thrilled at, at uh, your video. Thank you. What do we do? In the United Methodist Church, bishops are still bringing charges, still bringing people to trial for being homosexual. Do you have any suggestions about what in the world do we do to change this? Well, it's changing. Uh, it just takes bishops a while to learn that. <laughs> the fact is, the first time a prejudice begins to be debated publicly, it is beginning to die. So this seems already dead. It's just a matter of moving into it. Now, I grew up in the civil rights movement in the South. I lived in eastern North Carolina, a little town of 7,500 people, literally divided by Panola Street from the black half to the white half. And people thought we would never change. But we have. And what happens is that when reality brings itself to the place where you can't dodge it anymore, you either retreat from reality or you begin the process of changing. And if you can't change, what happens, and I don't mean this negatively, but what happens is that you die. I don't mean you die because you can't embrace reality. I mean, you die because reality is going to keep on coming no matter how long you live. And so if you can't adjust, you die, and your children adjust. And if they have trouble adjusting, they die, and their children adjust. 
but the battle's over. Now, the perfect sign of this is in the last rump session of the Congress, you know, the, the dead-end week, where I think more got accomplished than has been accomplished in all the two years we were there before. We got rid of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, in a simple vote, with no filibuster. And when it died, I haven't heard anybody beating the drum to resurrect it. Oh, yes. Well, well they're not very loud. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's good. Uh, I just don't think, I think that you, you look at the culture, and we're in a terribly difficult time politically right now, because the culture is having to embrace the fact, the dominant culture is having to embrace the fact that we have an African American in the White House, and though they would never say I'm racist, they say, well, there must be something wrong with him. He was probably not born in this country. <laughs> they do all sorts of strange stuff. But that's going to all dissipate. It's just that we've got to get through this tough patch. And I think the same thing is true. I think in the churches, you are faithful, and you make your witness, and you don't try to hide, and you help your bishops grow. And the thing that helped me grow it was an open and honest and real and loving gay and lesbian people made me make judgments about them that didn't fit my stereotypes. And the Methodist Church is changing. Oh, last week I was at First Methodist Church in Omaha. That's a vital, live congregation. And ten years ago, their minister, Jimmy Creech, was put on trial for blessing a gay union. And he was banished from the Methodist Church, and half the congregation pulled out. But the other half said, no, we have a new vision. We're going to be faithful. And today, that rump session, 10 years later, is back to its original size and thriving. And the group that pulled out is shriveling. You've got to be faithful. You don't do it statistically. You don't worry about statistics. You know, on Good Friday, Jesus is pretty alone. Adolf Hitler always had great crowds. Which one shaped history? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't worry about whether you're winning or losing. You worry about whether your witness is faithful, and you make it daily, and you make it publicly. And I would say to gay and lesbian people, come out of the closet and confront your family and your friends. Come out. the rest of us when you don't come out because we can then go on in our prejudices. Uh, the Methodist Church is going to make it. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And in their general conference, they keep hauling in people from the third world because they know they've lost the vote. <laughs> so they keep hauling in people so they pack the decks. <laughs> Here we are with another question, sir. Okay. I'll try to make my answer briefer. <laughs> Steve Holland, uh, like my colleague who just asked a question, a United Methodist pastor, about to retire and move to Beloit, Wisconsin. Can you help me with the flip side of it? How do I love or avoid bringing my prejudice to my new governor, Scott Walker, at that point? <laughs> well, have you ever heard of a recall? <laughs> that blatantly political. <laughs> but I think that it's our responsibility as citizens of this country to do exactly what I suggested that the Methodists do, stand out honestly and confront politicians so they have to deal with you. And that's what helps people grow. I've never met a politician that didn't want to win. You know, that means they'll almost do anything. We have politicians that change colors every time a new poll comes in. Uh, they are they're addicted to what I call the sweet narcotic of human praise. And they're empty. I'd almost rather deal with a rock-ribbed conservative that has conviction than a mushy liberal who changes color every time a new poll arrives. But I think you've got to stand up and be done. Back here, Bishop, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Jeannie Clark, and um, Bishop, I am so delighted to um, have been able to hear you tonight. <coughs> Thank you so much for coming to the Chicago suburbs. And my question is a personal one. Um, why do you, a straight man, care enough to stick your neck out? 
That's a good question. I don't know how to answer it briefly. Uh, when I retired, Harper Collins, my publisher, came to me and said, why don't you write your autobiography? And I said, who besides my mother would want to read it? <laughs> And then my editor said, whether you like it or not, in your career you've been in the center of the three great revolutions in consciousness, race, women, and homosexuals. And whether by skill or political intuition or just blind luck, you've always been sort of in the middle of the transition. And you've been able to change. And if you could write the story of what helped you to change in each of those transitions, then you'd be writing everybody's story, and that's what an autobiography is supposed to do. Otherwise, there's no reason for writing one. And so that was my that was my challenge. My story was to write how it is that a guy that grew up racist, anti-female, anti-Semitic, and homophobic turned out to be me. <laughs> now, there's a lot of transition in all of those, and I've hinted it just a little bit tonight. And so I wrote this story. And as I say, the only reason, the only justification for writing an autobiography, which is the, the overt and final act of egocentricity, <laughs> is that somehow in telling your story, you're helping articulate everybody else's journey. And uh, that book is called Here I Stand which is Harper's title. I don't care for that title because they wanted me to look like Luther. <laughs> I can buy a Luther, it's not a problem, but I just thought, well, let Luther stand alone with it. <laughs> My title was what they gave the subtitle. My struggle for a Christianity of integrity, love, and equality. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it still bothers, it still touches me when I, when I read that book. Back here, Bishop, please. Well, Bishop, my name is Audrey DeCourcy. I'm a pastor in Elgin, and I have to thank you for one thing, which is about you talked at my college out in Oregon about 10 years ago, and that's probably part of why I went into ministry uh, in my life, so I have to thank you for that. Thank you. What was the college? Uh, Lewis and Clark okay. College. Yeah, I know it quite well. It's yeah. Terrible. Yeah. That was Monica Lewinsky's college, too. <laughs> 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 my, my question is about the title of the talk, and I don't know, again, if you picked the title, um, but the homosexuality as battleground for dying form of Christianity. Um, my concern is that, yet again, homosexuality, our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters are asked to be the battleground, that gay and lesbian bodies are asked to be the battleground, and um, that it's gay and lesbian brothers and sisters asked to come out and be brave and come out and be strong and, and educate the rest of us. I think that the issue here is not homosexuality, it's homophobia and it's heterosexuality. So I guess I'd like to hear you talk about what is the crisis of heterosexuality facing the church and the world today and what do you have to say about the issue of heterosexuality for the church? Yeah, I don't think heterosexuality is the right word. I think, uh, if, 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 if homophobia is the proper thing that we're against and not homosexuals, it's heterosexual, whatever the, ad, the adjective form of that would be, and not heterosexuality. I don't think heterosexuality or homosexuality is a problem. I think both of them are morally neutral. Both of them can be lived out quite destructively. It really amazes me when, when somebody will say, do you, are you suggesting that there's no such thing as evil behavior by homosexual people? Of course I'm not saying that. Some of their behavior is absolutely raunchy. But maybe you haven't noticed that there's a good bit of raunchy heterosexuality. In world. <laughs> so maybe you ought to begin to compare apples with apples and, and orange oranges with oranges. Oh, I agree. Titles always baffle me because they ask for them six months before I get there. And I never know what I'm going to talk about. A woman couldn't practice law by a decision of the Supreme Court of 1876, eight to one majority, that said a woman was not fit to be a lawyer, that God had created her for the more domestic role. How about that? Uh, and we, we justified slavery. 
Pope has owned slaves in my church. The Bishop of Alabama resigned from being the bishop and accepted a commission in the Confederate Army to fight to preserve the institution of slavery. And he never saw anything wrong with that. And apartheid in South Africa. Uh, and now our victim, our current victim, is homosexuals. The first question I'd raise is, what is there about Christianity that always seems to have to have a victim? I think we ought to look at that. And maybe it, it is that the way we've told the Christian story is that we've made Jesus a victim. Uh, I think we ought to look at that. And we have trafficked in guilt. And when you make people feel guilty enough, they have to find somebody they can push the guilt off onto or they can't survive. So that's why so much of our church's liturgy is guilt producing. When we come to church on Sunday morning, we spend an awful lot of time telling God how wretched, miserable, sinful, lost, and fallen we are. And we sing hymns like, throw out the lifeline, or I was sinking deep in sin. And, and then we say the most incredible thing, it's okay because Jesus died for my sins. What kind of talk is that? <laughs> God's an ogre who killed Jesus because you couldn't take the punishment that was due to you? What kind of mentality is that? That's victim theology. And I think if you victimize the recipients of religious tradition, that inevitably they'll have to victimize others because that's the only way they survive. And what I'm suggesting about the last battleground is that we're about to run out of victims. And when we run out of victims, we then have to look in ourselves and see where the real problem is. And it is heterosexism. It's not homosex that's the problem. It's not, it is homophobia or heterosexism. You can have it either way. But we have to turn that channel of light inward. And maybe that will be the place where the ultimate re reformation of the Christian faith will begin. At least that's part of my hope. Yes, sir. Uh, John Mo Cheedler, Elmhurst, uh, class of 1959. Uh, please be careful for the court. Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to apologize for interrupting earlier, but um, okay. I couldn't resist. Um, oh, okay, thank you. Um, my question is, I have a very dear friend. This is a true story. I'm not asking about a friend. There will be a question. Uh, who is a pastor. And I think he's a very excellent pastor. Um, but he does have a problem with uh, what I think we call universal salvation. And I love what you said about nothing will separate us from the love of God, etc. And there are many other passages one could quote. But for him, it cuts the moral nerve if you don't, if, if you do have universal salvation. And I didn't hear you say there was another rule that said I couldn't ask the second question. So very quickly, uh, can you give us the context for those two passages in Leviticus uh, that might help us understand why the writer wrote that terrible stuff? Well, you're asking two questions that would take today and tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Let me suggest that uh, in a book called The Sins of Scripture, I went into the Leviticus task, but it takes a while. It's part of the holiness code. So let me go to the universal question, which is a good one. I find it really phenomenal that human beings abrogate to themselves the right to tell God whom God can love. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where we get that. And when you say it cuts the moral line, the suggestion is that if there isn't a way that you're going to get rewarded, then you wouldn't be good. That means that you're not good for God's sake, you're good for your sake. And that's a radical act of self-centeredness. And that's hardly what we're talking about when we talk about the Christian story. Uh, okay, there's something about organized religion that is always dangerous. And that is, organized religion acts as if it can make pronouncements in the name of God. It acts as if it can control access to God. What an incredible concept. Where did that idea come from? Uh, I just finished writing a book uh, on why I believe in life after death. It's called Eternal Life, A New Vision. And before I could get into that book, I had to get rid of all the things like that which you're speaking. That is, I had to get rid of any concept of reward and punishment. 
I think that's a very juvenile concept. That's not, you don't even raise children. A good parent wouldn't raise a child by saying, you're a good kid, I'll give you a reward. If you're a bad kid, I'll give you a punishment. Because you know that doesn't raise them a mature person, and yet we attribute that kind of behavior to God. And I grew up, and God's primary activity was keeping record books up to date. <laughs> my mother used to say to me, she was a good Presbyterian lady, my mother used to say to me, son, now you remember, when I can't see you, God can. <laughs> well, I was a lot more afraid of mother than I was of God. <laughs> Mother was a very present threat. God was a very distant threat. <laughs> but that, if, if the only reason, if the only motivation for leading a good life is to get a reward or to reward, or avoid a punishment, then you are still in a childlike parent-child relationship with God, and the time has come to grow up. I may be quoting my present. <laughs> church doesn't like mature adults. <laughs> That's why we always want you to be born again. <laughs> you just get born again often enough, you never have to grow up. <laughs> we don't need to be born again. We need to mature. We need to get past our Sunday school attitude toward God as a heavenly parent or the heavenly sheriff. Because that's primarily the way we look at God to this day. And that's an enormous revolution in thinking. And we've, we've raised up in our generation a group of very militant and very competent atheist writers like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchin. And they're national bestsellers. But the God that they're rejecting is the same God I reject. I don't know how to talk to these guys. Because they can beat up on this God, but I beat up on that same concept of God. And I just don't think that's who God is. But they don't know any other possibility. And so they think that this is the only way you can think about God. It's nonsensical, so we're going to throw it away and we're going to be atheist. Well, atheist doesn't mean there is no God. Atheist means you reject the theistic definition of God. That's what atheist literally means. And I think it's time for us to get beyond the theistic definition of God as the supernatural parent in the sky who always guides the football through the goalpost <laughs> because God loves the Chicago Bears. <laughs> so I've got a question back here, Bishop, from one of our fabulous students. Okay. You're on the base. Okay, now everybody's looking at me, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nana Kalandadishvili, and I'm an exchange student from Republic of Georgia, and my question is a bit more broad, probably. In my country, we're independent for the last 20 years, and we come a long way, but um, with the homosexuality, the attitudes are exactly the same as you were describing that were in US and 60 years ago. And we have church number one trusted institution in the country, with 30% different, was the second place, which is government. And we're Orthodox Christian, which is pretty orthodox about all of that. And most people still believe the gay should die. Sorry for saying that. What can you recommend to common citizens? How can I, for example, start a discussion? How can each citizen initiate something in a situation like that? Thank you. Well, the good thing is that you would want to do so. I think the tragedy is that so many of our young people have been so turned off by what they perceive as the meaning of religion or Christianity that they don't even want to start the discussion. The thing we have going for us, I believe, is that human beings, I think, are by nature religious people. The content of the religion changes. There's never been a history. Anthropologists cannot show us any time a people existed that didn't have some religious concept. They differed, but there's always been a religious concept. Because to be human is to be self-conscious. And to be self-conscious is to ask questions of meaning that are not asked in the sub-self-conscious world. And no sheep spends any time wondering what it's like to be a sheep or what is the purpose of being a sheep. But human beings do. We ask questions of purpose, we ask questions of meaning, and we're the only creature that has to deal consciously with the reality of our own death. And religion is born in our attempt to make sense out of this kind of human experience. So I think that's where we start. The task of any religion mine, yours, anybody's religion, 
is to try to make sense out of self-conscious life that is terrifying to self-conscious people. And so we have a place, I think, that's common that we can begin. I hold the Christian church responsible for the death of the Christian church, or the apparent death of the Christian church. And certainly when I go through Europe, it is, uh, it is a dying and pretty much irrelevant institution. Uh, the only people that go to church in France seem to me to be tourists. <laughs> and they're there to see the great cathedrals. Uh, we were in Belgium doing some lectures at the University of Ghent, and I talked with a Roman Catholic professor of New Testament at the seminary. And we were there probably about 2003 or four. He told me he hadn't had a graduate from the seminary since 1998, had nobody in the pipeline. And the average age of the Roman Catholic priest in Belgium was at that point 72. Uh, if that has not changed, the average age is today 80. And I went to Finland just to make sure it wasn't a Catholic problem, because Finland's about 95% Protestant Lutheran. And I found that less than 4% of the population of Finland is ever inside the church in the course of a year. And that includes when they go for funerals, and when they go for weddings, and when they go for public baptisms. So the number of people attending worship is just almost non-existent. And I think we're beginning to see that pattern happening in the United States. And what people are rejecting is a religious point of view that no longer makes sense in terms of the revolution in thinking that we've undergone for the last 500 years. I don't have time to stretch it, but we can start with Copernicus and work through Galileo and Isaac Newton and Sigmund Freud and, and uh, or Charles Darwin and Sigmund Freud and Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking, who have changed the way we've had to look at the world. And what we're doing is trying to communicate a first century theological understanding to a 21st century world that no longer thinks in the same terms. And instead of engaging these issues, we spent an enormous amount of energy trying to condemn Galileo. And we're still trying to condemn Darwin. Why don't we get over it? <laughs> <laughs> Darwin's correct. Everybody, everybody, so I want us to engage reality. And if our vision of God disappears in engaging reality, then maybe our vision was wrong. Maybe there is no God. Maybe our vision is wrong and we could come up with a whole different understanding of how to say the holy name, which is what I believe is the situation. Uh, I don't know how to do it in your culture, but I think if you want to ask that question, that's the place to start. And I'll bet you you'll find in your generation in Georgia, a lot of people who are raising the same issue that you're raising. Our time is getting short, so quick questions, please. Quick answers is what you want. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that, Bishop. I'm uh, Sean Whitty. I'm, in a, I'm a Roman Catholic uh, in that tradition. I just, um, and this may not be a fair question to a, an Episcopal bishop, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, what do you make of like the madness of the Roman Catholic uh, uh, hierarchy?